Hello and welcome on behalf of all of SCM. This is the first part of a series of short video tutorials in which we want to demonstrate and explore various different topics in chemistry and material science and demonstrate various different features of the Amsterdam modeling suite. In this tutorial we will be using the program BAND and we will calculate effective mass tensors for phosphorines. So that is a single layered material with its layer originating from a black phosphorus crystal in pretty much the same way as graphene originates from graphite. As such, it has some pretty interesting electronic properties. Today we're gonna look at the anisotropy of its electron mobilities, and we're gonna study those by means of a band structure analysis as well as effective mass tensors. What are effective mass tensors? This theory is in principle based on Newton's second law, F equals M times A. However, in the present context, these quantities gain a slightly different notion. For example, the acceleration becomes the rate of change of the group velocity depicted here, while the force relates to the rate of change of the crystal momentum. We can then take this expression for the force, uh, reorder quantities and insert it into the acceleration. We then find that after we worked out the math, we end up with a Hessian-like quantity, so second derivatives of the energy with respect to elements of the k vector. And this is our effective mass. One can understand this in the following way. If an electron is in a vacuum and a certain force acts on it, the resulting acceleration directly relates to the electron mass. However, in a crystalline material, so in any periodic potential, the motion of an electron can vastly differ from the motion of an electron in a vacuum. As a result, if a force acts on that electron, a different acceleration may result. It may not only be different in magnitude, but also in direction. And the effective mass tensor is basically the quantity which relates these two, force and acceleration. To start setting up our calculation, we begin with the structure. Now the structure of phosphorine itself is rather hard to find. Instead of that, we will use the structure of crystalline black phosphorus and work our way from there. This structure is rather easily found. In our case, I resort to the website of the materials project to download the symmetrized structure variant in a SIF file format. We can then proceed by importing this structure into the graphical user interface of the Amsterdam modeling suit. This is the result, this is the black phosphorus crystal, and you can easily make out the individual layers of this material. In order to convert that into a model for a phosphorine monolayer, I select the atoms, one of these layers, and I delete them. Next, we pick Edit, Crystal, and generates lab, which opens another options panel. I then pick the correct Miller indices of the cutting plane. I briefly verify that this is what we want. I pick a single number of layers and then click on generate crystal in order to obtain this monolayer model. As you can see here, this is nice and symmetric. This is what we want. And we then proceed by selecting a few more calculation options. First and foremost, I would like the structure to be relaxed, so I pick geometry optimization as a task. Furthermore, under options, I also pick optimize lattice in order to enable the relaxation of the lattice parameters. I then pick libxc in order to select my functional. I type in here PBE in order to use this functional, which is a pretty standard GGA. I select a triple zeta p basis set, which is supposed to be large enough to do this calculation to represent this model accurately. I avoid using frozen core and I select a good numerical quality preset. However, we have to put a few more details into here, namely the k space. We have to increase this a little bit. We will pick good op as an option here. Furthermore, we want this k-space grid to be symmetric, which makes a lot of sense since we're dealing with a very symmetric system. 
Next, I have to enable the calculation of the band structure, because this is one of the quantities we're going to look at. And furthermore, I increase the number of interpolation case space points in order to calculate this band structure. We are almost ready to go, but we have to set the most important option here, which is the effective mass. We find it under properties, effective mass. We enable this one. There are a few more options about this, which can be found under details, expert band. If you scroll down, you will find a section about effective masses. What we do here is we manually enter K point coordinate, namely the gamma point, because I would like to evaluate the effective mass tensor only at the gamma point in order to compare my results with the literature. With that, we are good to go. We save our calculation, give it a meaningful name, phosphorine mono layer, save it, and then in principle we can start the calculation by clicking on run here. While the calculation is running, let's take a look at the results which are out there in the literature. This tutorial is based on a recent paper which appeared a couple of years ago as an open access article in the Journal of Physics. In this computational study conducted with the plane wave program VASP, the researchers were looking at the band parameters of phosphorine and how they change if a mechanical strain is applied or if an electric field is present. But these are of course more complex issues. We will not go into so much detail. However, there is nonetheless some useful information we can extract from this paper. First and foremost, let's take a look at the unit cell which is depicted here and the corresponding Berlioz zone. So the unit cell in reciprocal space. As you can see here, these vectors behave inversely proportional. So if the lattice vector in real space in x direction is long, it will be shorter in the reciprocal space and vice versa. Towards the end of the article, we then can find some results which are more in line with what we are calculating. So first in figure two, you can see a band structure plot of the valence band around the gamma point in the two different directions in the Brunegian zone. You see immediately that there is a high anisotropy, so the band behaves vastly different in x direction than it does in y direction. We will later see why this is so. And further down you then see some reference value for the effective masses. It may take a while to perform the full optimization of the entire unit cell and lattice, but eventually the calculation will be finished. So the first thing we do is check how the optimization went. You can see that under SCM and movie. As you can see here, we indeed seem to have reached some sort of minimum. And just by looking at the structure, this is the beginning. You can watch the movie how this went. Obviously, there is some coupling between lattice and internal degrees of freedom, but ultimately we end up with a structure which is pretty reasonable. Next, we look at the band structure. To do that, we select again SCM and band structure. So this shows two different things. On the left side, we can either switch between the real space view and the Berlin zone. We immediately notice here that compared to what was used in the paper, our structure is turned by 90 degrees. So the labels for X and Y will be swapped. On the right side, we see the band structure. This is plotted on an auto-generated path. In order to get a comparable result to the paper, I will manually enter this path. I click on reorder and then it should replot it. You can see here, we can also change the zoom level vertically and horizontally in order to look at the valence band here and at the conduction band on top. So this in itself is already pretty comparable to the image of the reference paper. We also see another thing if we look more closely. And we compared to the gamma point and the energy there, we find that there is a slight maximum, a little bit offset from the gamma point in x direction. We actually also see that in the plot of the reference paper. And we will see in a moment what effect that has. 
To look at some more results, we select SCM and output, which opens the ADF output window. If we scroll down somewhere towards the end, we will find the final converged geometry. And the first thing we're going to do is to compare that with what is reported in the reference paper. To do that, I already prepared some results into a spreadsheet. We will now enter our results into that as well. So we have 3.3 for the first vector and 4.66 roughly for the second one. If we compare this to what is reported in the paper, you will see that this matches pretty well, especially given that we used a totally different program and totally different numerical methods to describe our system. If we scroll down further towards the end, we will then finally arrive at the section for the effective masses. So this is organized band-wise, so each band around the Fermi gap has its eigenvalues of the band curvature and the resulting effective masses printed here. This is done for two different step sizes, so it's worth mentioning that the corresponding eigenvalues emerging from that for these two step sizes should match. Only then you can be sure that this result is roughly correct. And this is then followed by the corresponding eigenvectors, which basically shows in which way the ellipsoid is rotated. In our case, that is pretty simple. The eigenvectors are simply the Cartesian directions here. So next we will also compare those values. So first we look at the valence band. This one is below the Fermi level. And we will find that there is a large effective mass, which we'll also enter here, as well as a small negative one. And we repeat the same for the conduction band. For both of these two values. The conduction band value is pretty well reproduced. So one gets a value which in the case of the y direction is pretty much identical. The order of magnitude of the second one is also roughly correct. In the case of the valence band, situation is slightly different. The order of magnitude of this value matches pretty well. So we have uh, 7.2 in the reference paper compared to 8.6 in our result. And we have a small negative value, which is about minus 0.12. So why is this negative? Uh, if you remember, we just discussed that the band in x direction is not at its maximum at the gamma point, rather the maximum is slightly shifted away. And so one doesn't really have a parabola at that point, which explains the negative value. However, this is also present in the reference paper, as well as in some other references. And it is furthermore mentioned that in the case of the valence band, because this uh, situation is so tricky, the result varies strongly with the method applied. So there we go. These are our final results. And the tutorial showed you how to set up these calculations and where to find these results. What we can conclude from this small exercise is basically that the electron mobility in phosphorine is vastly anisotropic. So in x direction here, the electron has a much easier time to be moved by any electric field or force applied. While in the orthogonal y direction, the electron mass is larger, so this motion will be hampered. Similar things hold for the valence band, whereas we are not at the optimal location to calculate the effective mass tensor. So this concludes the first part of SCM's series of video tutorials. If you liked it, we would appreciate any feedback. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them either down in the comments below or directly via email info at scm.com.